Hi guys, in this video I'm going to look at the LX Mill Mini CNC and Laser Engraver. This is a small 3-axis milling or engraving machine supplied in kit form. It can mill and engrave several different types of material, which we'll be testing later in the video. This is what you get in the kit. The frame is made from 2040 aluminium extrusion and acrylic plates. All of the lead screws are 8mm. The X and Y axes are driven by NEMA 17 stepper motors. The Y axis stepper is directly connected to a lead screw with a coupler. The X axis stepper is connected to a lead screw via a toothed belt. And the Z axis stepper is driven by a NEMA 17 stepper motor with a through lead screw. Support is provided by rods and linear bearings. The table is made from a single piece of aluminium extrusion and the effective milling area of the machine is 130 by 90 millimeters. The stepper motors are controlled by a controller PCB which is labelled LX Manor version 5.2. This runs Gerbil 0.9i on an Arduino Nano clone. The clone uses a CH340 USB serial port chip which requires a CH340 driver to be installed. Also on the controller PCB are three stepper motor driver carriers. There's a pin header to allow the connection of limit switches, which are not supplied, and also probe connections for height mapping. The spindle speed and laser power are controlled by a PWM or pulse width modulation signal from pin 11 on the Arduino Nano. This switch is an LR120N FET, which supplies power to the spindle motor or laser module. The spindle motor is a 555 unit, 36 millimeters in diameter, and it operates on 12 volts DC with a specified no load speed of 8000 RPM. The laser is a 500 milliwatt unit and it fits into the Z-axis carriage assembly in place of the spindle motor. The power supply is a brick type with a C8 figure of eight input connector. It's suitable for 110 or 240 volts input and it has a 12 volt five amp output. The instructions for the kit are located on the Elix Maker website and they come in the form of a set of photographs showing the construction. They show you just enough detail to build the machine and there's also a forum where you can ask questions. Moving on to the build, I started with the Z-axis carriage assembly. Two linear bearings were installed into the bottom acrylic plate and two linear bearings into the top acrylic plate. A brass anti-backlash flange was attached to the top acrylic plate. Four threaded spacers were screwed into the top plate. And then the two plates joined together. Two guide rods were slid through the linear bearings and the assembly adjusted to operate smoothly. The knob was installed on the Z-axis stepper motor shaft and the stepper motor installed on the top mounting plate. The Z-axis lead screw was threaded into the anti-backlash flange and the nut and spring installed to complete the anti-backlash mechanism. The top and bottom mounting plates were screwed onto the guide rods. and the mechanism tested to ensure it operated smoothly. Next linear bearings were installed into the left and right acrylic plates. An anti-backlash flange was attached to the left-hand acrylic plate. The left and right acrylic plates were attached to the aluminium extrusion with T-nuts and bolts.
The two plates were aligned with the guide rods. The two parts were then bolted together. Next the table bed was built, linear bearings were installed in the front and back acrylic plates. And then an anti-backlash flange was attached to the front acrylic plate. The two plates were bolted to the aluminium extrusion that forms the table using T-nuts and bolts. and the two plates aligned with guide rods. Next the base frame was constructed. Rubber feet were bolted onto the aluminium extrusion that forms the sides of the frame. T-nuts were slotted into the sides of the aluminium extrusion for use later on. The white axis stepper motor was installed onto the back plate of the frame. And then the front and back plates were bolted to the two sides. Next, the table was bolted into the base frame. The Y-axis lead screw was threaded into the anti-backlash flange and the anti-backlash nut and spring installed. The lead screw was connected to the stepper motor with a blue coupler. A bearing was installed in the front of the frame, followed by three plastic spacers and the Y axis adjustment knob. Once again, checking that everything operated smoothly. Next, the gantry was constructed. The handle was bolted onto the aluminium extrusion. And the X-axis stepper motor was mounted onto the right-hand acrylic plate. The two sides were bolted to the aluminium extrusion. And the gantry was bolted to the base frame using the T-nuts that we pre-installed earlier. The X-axis lead screw was threaded into the carriage assembly. The X-axis guide rods inserted into the linear bearings. Next, the carriage assembly was mounted to the gantry. The rods were bolted to the gantry side plates.
A bearing was installed in the right hand side plate, followed by a plastic spacer and a tooth pulley. Another tooth pulley was installed on the X axis stepper motor shaft, and then the belt was installed and tensioned. A bearing was installed in the left hand side plate, followed by four plastic spacers and the X axis adjustment knob. Next the collet was fitted to the spindle motor. The spindle motor was inserted into the carriage assembly and secured with mounting screws. Next the x-axis stepper motor cable was fitted. Then the y-axis stepper motor cable. Spiral cable wrap was used to bundle the z-axis stepper motor cable along with the spindle motor cable. These were also installed. Before finally plugging in the USB cable and the power. Moving on to the software, LXCAM can be downloaded from the LXMaker website. You can use it to install the CH340 COM port driver. Clicking this button automatically selects the COM port and then from the setting menu the controller mode can be set by selecting machine and then laser mode. Laser mode is used for both the laser module and the spindle motor. Server mode is used to enable a pen plotter in other LX Maker products. Alternatively you can download the CH340 driver separately and then set the controller mode to laser by sending the A0 G code command to the controller. Next I'm going to install Gerbil Control. This is open source software used to control and send G-code to the machine. You can find a link to it in the video description. There are lots of other software options but one thing to bear in mind is that the command supported by Gerbil changed after version 1 so it's important to check that the software supports the version of Gerbil installed on the controller which in this case is version 0.9. Once the software is installed the serial port is selected the jog key should now be working, but probably one or more of the axes will be moving in the wrong direction. In this case the Y and the Z axis directions are reversed. These can be changed with the $3 direction port invert mask command. To view the current setting, type $$ into the console. This lists the current Gerbil settings. Scroll up to $3, which is currently set to 0. And referring to the table, we want to invert the Y and the Z axis, but not the X axis, which gives us a setting value of 6. Type $3 equals 6 into the console. Gerbil will store this setting even when the power is off, so the operation doesn't need to be repeated. The jog command should now move the axes in the correct directions. The steps per millimeter for each axis also needs to be configured. The settings are $100, 101, and 102, and they should all be set to 400. The Z axis is currently set to 80, and that's corrected by entering. $102 equals 400. Now we can set up a workpiece. It's a good idea to install a spoil board to save the table surface. The workpiece that I'm using is one of the wooden blocks supplied with the kit, and this was stuck to the spoil board with double sided adhesive tape. The jog keys are used to move the end mill to the front left hand corner of the block. The knobs can also be used to move the axes by hand. The end mill is set so that it just touches the surface of the block. And then the X, Y and Z coordinates are zeroed. The safe height can be configured under service and settings. And the M mill moved up to the safe height with the safe Z button. Next we need some CAD software to turn our designs into G-code. A good free option is Easel, which is an online browser based application that you can find on the Inventables website. So let's have a go at creating something. To access it you just need to sign up and log in. And then you'll be presented with a blank project screen. First select the machine menu and then we can enter the size of the work area. 
which is 130 by 90 millimeters. Next enter material dimensions of 60 by 40 millimeters. And a thickness of 11 millimeters. Set the material type to wood. And select a V bit. Then under cut settings, select custom. And I'm going to start with conservative values of 100 millimeters per minute feed rate, 80 millimeters per minute plunge rate, and half a millimeter per pass. Next, select one of the predefined images. And set its cut depth to 1 mm. The image can be moved and resized with a mouse. Select the Shape tab. Then we can set the size of the image. And its position. The origin can also be set. From the cut tab, set the outline to on path. Now let's create some text. Select a font. Resize and position the text. Set the cut depth to one millimeter. Then set the outline to one path. Select both objects to show the alignment tools. And then we can align the two objects. Give the project a name. And generate the G code by selecting Machine, Advanced, Generate G code, and Export G code. Finally, you can run a simulation to see how long the job will take. I'm going to use one of the V bits supplied with the kit, fitting it into the collet and securing it with grub screws. To prevent the grub screws coming loose, I use heat shrink tube, which works very well, but you can also use insulation tape or thread lock. Next the V-bit was positioned, and the axis zeroed. The bit was raised to a safe height. Then the G-code was loaded. And sent to the machine with the send button. I have also tried cutting a panel out of 1.2mm thick aluminium sheet using a 2mm end mill. 
the feed rate is 80 millimeters per minute, plunge rate 30 millimeters per minute, and half millimeter depth per pass. The simulation estimates that this is going to take about 16 minutes. To hold the material down, I used painter's tape and CA mitre adhesive. First I applied tape to the sheet, and then to the spoil board. I sprayed activator on the sheet side, and then applied adhesive to the spoil board side. When they're pressed together, it forms a very strong, almost instant bond. To lubricate the end mill, I used CT90 cutting fluid. I used quite a bit of fluid to try and keep the aluminium chip suspended. Once it's finished, the workpiece can be levered up. And overall, it gives a good, accurate finish. Next, to cut a small sign out of 3mm thick acrylic sheet using a 1.5mm end mill. I use the feed rate of 120mm per minute, 100mm per minute plunge rate, and half millimetre depth per pass. The simulation predicted that this would take 39 minutes. I used the tape and glue mounting method once again, leaving the protective film on the back of the acrylic, and removing it from the front. I used cast acrylic, which machines easily. Extruded acrylic, on the other hand, just melts on the bit, and it doesn't give good results. The good thing about using the green painter's tape is that you can see when the end mill has cut through the material. To mount the acrylic sign, I made a base out of three layers of six millimeter or quarter inch thick plywood. I used a feed rate of 120 millimeters per minute, 100 millimeters per minute plunge rate, and half a millimeter depth per pass. The top and middle layers are identical and have a slot to hold the acrylic sign.
The base layer has a cutout section in which to mount the LED tape. To finish, the upper sections were glued together. LED tape was stuck into the bottom section, then the top was glued to the bottom. The acrylic sign could then be inserted into the base. Next I created a through hole PCB design in Eagle, then using flat cam I opened the Gerber and drill files, set the milling and drill parameters, and then exported the output as G-code. To mount the blank PCB sheet, I 3D printed some clamps. PCB sheet has a very thin copper layer, and although it looks flat, it's not good enough to mill fine traces accurately without taking account of the height variations. To do that, we can use an electrical probe to create a height map, connecting the copper side of the PCB to the A5 probe connection, and the milling bit to the ground connection. The G-code is then loaded into Gerbil Control, and a height map created, which takes account of the height variations when the G-code is run. The probes are then removed and the PCB milled. The bit that I'm using is a V-bit and to get good results it's important to make sure it's properly centered and spinning true. The V-bit is then changed for a drill bit. The drill bit height is zeroed using the probe. And then the component mounting holes are drilled. Finally the drill bit is replaced with an end mill, the Z height zeroed, and the board outline milled. Next I created a surface mount version of the PCB. This was imported into Chili Pepper Gerbil, which is a browser based G-code sender. It mounted the board with tape and an excessive amount of glue. The probe was connected in the same way as before, but I had some problems with electrical noise, so I ran the wires through ferret cores. Then from Chili Pepper Gerbil, height probing was initiated. The height map was used to modify the G-code, which was then sent to the machine. There are some marks on the copper, and that's from a first attempt where I forgot to use the height map.
The V bit was changed to a drill bit to drill some small holes. And then the drill bit was changed to an end mill to mill some larger holes and the board outline. Now let's have a look at the laser module. This is a 500 milliwatt class 4 laser which can burn the skin or cause devastating and permanent eye damage. So it's important to wear eye protection. Protection glasses are not provided with the kit so you have to buy them separately. The laser module fits into the holder in place of the spindle motor and there is a three wire cable to connect between the module and the controller. The module isn't fixed, it does work okay like that but I decided to wedge it in position with some coffee stirrers. The button on the top enables a weak output mode and the laser can be focused to a sharp point by turning the adjustment ring. Laser output can also be turned on from the console by sending the M3 G code command. The S value determines the strength of the output. M5 turns the laser off. Once the laser is roughly focused you can fine tune it by adjusting the Z axis. A small circuit board supplied with the kit is used to test the laser. The button is connected to the PWM input of the laser and pressing it should turn the laser off. The laser can be operated with the LX Cam software that we installed earlier. First the COM port is selected, the arrow keys are used to jog the axes and the step size can be selected. The set home button sets the axes to zero and the home button returns the axis back to the home position. You can set the feed rate or engraving speed. S port T is the time taken for the laser to burn one spot and the number of repetitions can be set. Under the setting menu the laser power level can be set and it can be turned on or off with the laser button. The weak button is used to operate the laser with a reduced power level and its value can also be set. G code commands can be sent from the command line. G-code could be loaded and sent from a file. Pick carve and text carve are used to engrave images and text. The gallery menu displays a set of example pictures that can be engraved with pick carve. So let's engrave this wolf. First the size is changed. I've no idea why this error occurs but it doesn't seem to affect anything. Set the home position and the engraving speed. The preview button outlines where the engraving will take place and then press start. The material that I'm using is the little square of plywood supplied with the kit. Next let's try text carve, enter some text, change the size, set the laser speed, the carving mode and the font. For some reason it asks to select the font again. And then we get another error, so ignoring that, we can preview. And start. This is another of the samples included with the kit.
An alternative to LXCAM is LaserGerbil, which is open source software that you can download. I'll leave a link to this and everything else that I've used in the video description. To start communication, select the COM port and then press the connect button. The jog controls are located on the bottom left of the screen, along with a home button, a speed slider, and a step size slider. There are also buttons for Gerbil Reset, Gerbil Unlock, Set Zero Point, Feed Resume, and Feed Hold. To add a custom button, right click in the button area. Let's add a button to turn on the laser with a low power level for focusing. The M3G code command turns the laser on. The S value determines the laser power level. M5 turns the laser off. Add some text and an icon. We can import an image by selecting File, Open File, select the image. There are options for line to line tracing with a grayscale or black and white. One bit black and white dithering, which produces an emulated grayscale black and white image. Vectorize, which traces the image. And centerline, which traces center lines. You can also rotate, flip, crop, and invert the image. Select Next. Then there are options for the engraving speed, the laser on and off G-code commands, the minimum and maximum laser power levels, and the image size and position. Select Create. And then you can send the image to the laser with the Run Program button. G-code can also be loaded into Laser Gerbil. As an example, I've created some text in Easel. I've selected Custom Cut Settings. The feed rate is the speed of the laser, which I've set to 50 millimeters per minute. The value of the plunge rate doesn't matter. And the depth per pass should be set to a value greater than the thickness of the material defined in Easel. And that's to make sure that the resulting G-code will only contain one pass. The G-code can now be exported and open with a text editor. The command used to turn the spindle motor and the laser on is M03 S1000. The S value determines the spindle speed or the laser power level and the command to turn them off is M05. First we should replace the initial M3 command with M5 as we don't want the laser to be turned on at the very start of the program. Next we need to search for any commands that move the z-axis. Commands that move the z-axis upwards are replaced with M05 to turn the laser off and commands that move the z-axis downwards are replaced with M03 S1000, which turns the laser on with full power. And we carry on until all the commands that move the z-axis are replaced. Now we can save the g-code to a new file, open it with laser gerbil, and send it to the laser with the run program button. The material that I'm using is adhesive backed vinyl, otherwise known as sticky back plastic, and the idea was to make some stickers. The feed rate that I used for this was 50 millimeters per minute, but I think a faster feed rate with multiple passes might give a better cut. We can also make PCBs with the help of the laser, once again exporting the design from Eagle, importing the Gerber files into FlatCam, exporting the G-code from FlatCam, and then editing the G-code with a text editor in the same way as before. The copper side of the blank PCB material is then lightly sprayed with matte black paint and left to dry overnight. The G-code is loaded into Laser Gerbil and sent to the machine. The laser burns away the paint, exposing the copper layer, It does leave a residue, which I clean away with a soft toothbrush and washing up detergent. The paint layer is surprisingly tough, so you can give it a good scrub. I repeat the process two more times to get rid of the paint residue. 
Next, the PCB is etched. I'm using sodium persulfate. To help remove the copper, I rub over the tracks with another soft toothbrush. If you shine a light through the back of the PCB, you can see when the copper is etched. After a rinse in water to remove the etching, I finally remove the paint with thinners. You can also use a similar process to etch solder paste stencils, and you can engrave PCB images instead of using isolation routing. OK guys, that's it for this video. If you want to know more, then I've left links to everything that I've used in the video description. Thanks for watching, and see you again next time.